Terry Kath is guitar playing, singing, and his personal life. There's always a lot of whys asked, and for a lot of reasons. Hopefully we can answer some of them in this video. Now the group Chicago was the main part of Terry's musical career. And you'll hear me speak of them, and a few of its members at times, but I also feel that the group, intentionally or unintentionally, in a roundabout way, covered him and his talent up. So this is about Terry Cat, which in itself is hard to do, as finding information on Terry isn't easy either, especially if you want it directly from him. He didn't do many interviews or keep a diary. The second party information is out there, but still not a lot of it came out during the time he was with the band or shortly after his death. And what has come out later, some of it 30, 40 years after his death, could be a little bit hazy, as time does have a tendency to do that to a story. But it's all we have to go on and try to make sense of. So this video here is to try and shed some light to those people who only knew of the band Chicago as a group and never knew their leader. And for the rest of you, just a short video to look back on what I consider one of the best guitarists and musical minds of 70s music. Terry Kath was born January 31, 1946 in Chicago, Illinois. He started playing guitar in his early teens. His influences were many and a wide variety. Early on, from The Ventures and Dick Dale, and later anywhere from George Benson to Jimi Hendrix. Starting out, Terry actually played in a group which did covers of Venture songs and along with other popular tunes of the time. In 1961, he joined Jimmy Rice and the Gentlemen, a band which also included horn player Walt Perizader, who would also become a member of Chicago later on. In 1965, both Terry and Walt would join the group Jimmy Ford and the Executives, which was the backup band on Dick Clark's Caravan of Stars. In some of the earlier groups, Terry would play the bass guitar if needed. He would take some guitar lessons, but it didn't really hold his attention. He just said, all I wanted to do was play those rock and roll chords. So basically, Terry was a self-taught musician. And when you take that into consideration, it's a pretty amazing feat. He was really that talented. The other band members of Chicago were for the most part schooled and had years of formal training. And they admit they looked up to Terry as the leader of the band. If you're not familiar with Terry's playing, Here's a couple of suggestions of mine to give a listen to. These songs are some really great guitar work of Terry's. The first is Song of the Evergreens. This song wasn't released as a single that I remember, but the words and music are just brilliant. You can find the song on YouTube, throw on a set of headphones and give it a listen. Next is solo on the hit 25 or 6 to 4. It just speaks for itself. There's a live version of this on YouTube. I'll look it up and leave a link in the description. Also check out the song Make Me Smile. Not only listen to the guitar work, but also this is one where Terry carries the lead vocal. His voice is very soulful. In a way it kind of reminds me of a Dennis Edwards or a Paul Williams of The Temptations. And one more thing about his voice was that he was a very good harmony singer. Just an accomplished all around vocalist whether it was a song like Make Me Smile or a ballad like Color My World, he could cover it vocally. He played a variety of guitars, his favorite being a 66 Fender Telecaster. It's the one he had changed out the neck pickup on from a single coil to a humbucker, and also said he added a few capacitors to it. It was heavily modified in every sense, really. He also played a Stratocaster and a few different Gibson solid bodies but the 66 Tele is the guitar you see him playing the most from about 1972 until his death in 1978. It's the one with all the stickers on it. Some pictures show a bunch of Pignose stickers. Anyone not familiar with Pignose, it was a small amplifier that came out in the early 70s. Terry invested in it and was one of the founders of the Pignose company. It's still in business today. Anyone want to chime in here and enlighten us some more on Terry's guitars, feel free to do so in the comments section. 
As far as amps, one thing here about Terry, he was someone who loved to tinker and modify his gear to fit him. Guitars and amps both. Now here's a good picture of Terry on stage and a decent picture to zoom in on. This setup looks like a tube head, possibly one of the Heath kits he was said to have favored. If you look close, it looks like he has a head on each side of the cabinet, one probably for a backup. Same with one of the 215 cabs. He said he liked low wattage tube amps into a 215 cabinet. In the studio, he used a variety of amps, including the Fender Dual Showman and a Twin Reverb, and had even used an old Bogan tube PA head for a preamp. One thing he did say when he was asked about such low wattage amps on stage was, he had no trouble hearing himself as he was the only guitar player, so there wasn't another one to wash him out. Terry was also infatuated with guns. He wasn't a hunter really, he just enjoyed target shooting and going out into the woods and blasting away. He carried a gun around quite often, especially later on in life. A story told was, he once pulled one out on stage during an outside concert and just ripped off a few shots in the air. Another one was that him and Carl Wilson of the Beach Boys got into a scuffle over Terry's careless handling of a gun at a party where he was acting like he was playing Russian roulette. There are quite a few different stories out there. Are they really true? I don't know. But what I would think is there's enough stories floating around to make me believe that Terry just might have been careless with guns, and this sadly would eventually come back to bite him. Let me just say that there's no way I believe that Terry Kath intentionally took his own life. I don't believe that for one minute. I also do not believe it happened while playing a game of Russian roulette. Although he was careless enough with guns to where I can understand why someone might think this or even consider it. Terry died from a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head from a semi-automatic pistol. Don Johnson, who was a roadie for the band, was the only one there and saw what happened on January 23, 1978. From what he says, and to me, this is very believable. Terry, who had been up a few days partying, took out his automatic pistol and started playing around with it, which was very common for him from the stories told. Don told him to put it away. Well, Terry racked out all the bullets, accidentally leaving one in the chamber, and then just plain being careless as usual with guns, he put it to his head to show Don it wasn't loaded and pulled the trigger. The police report ruled it was accidental, and as I said, I truly believe it was, but it was something that could be expected. Being careless with a firearm is something that will come back to get you if you keep it up. Mixing cocaine, alcohol, and then being careless with a firearm is bound to get you. And sadly, Terry had pushed it to the limit. He died eight days before his 32nd birthday. You can let me know your feelings on this in the comments section if you can add more insight. Terry was working on writing a solo album at the time of his death. He was married and had a daughter named Michelle who was going on two years old. Later on in life, Michelle took on the task of learning who her father was. She put it all together in one of the best documentaries I've ever seen on a musician's life. It's called The Terry Cat Experience. It's about an hour and 20 minutes long and worth every minute of the time you spend to watch it. You can find it at this time on YouTube and it's free with a few ads. The link to it will be in the description below. Check it out. His daughter Michelle's website will be there also. On April 8, 2016, the band Chicago was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. During the ceremony in Brooklyn, New York, Michelle Kath Sinclair accepted the award on her father's behalf. Michelle's documentary and the induction into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame helped him bring in Terry Kath some of the recognition I think he deserves. Early in his career and right after his death, not many people knew his name. After he passed, the band moved on and, in my opinion, tried to sweep him and his death under the rug. I can understand why they did that. They had to keep working and making a living, and publicity like that could have hurt the group. So they kept going, and Terry kind of faded away, with the exception of a small group of fans. Terry played, sang, and wrote songs on the first nine Chicago albums, 
was a founding member and in the group from 1967 until 1978. He was considered the band leader. To me, he's one of the better guitarists to come out of the 70s music era, and his name should be brought up a bit more. There was talk that he was possibly considering leaving Chicago to form a smaller band and do his own thing. As I said earlier, he had been working and writing on a solo album at the time of his death. Had he lived, who knows where that would have taken him. One thing for sure, he had the talent to take it anywhere he wanted to. Let me hear your thoughts on Terry Kath and any stories you can share about him. Hope you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to check out that documentary his daughter Michelle put together, The Terry Kath Experience. It's loaded with so much information and even her search for all of her dad's guitars. It's on YouTube, and I'll leave a link in the description below, but by all means, watch it. You can thank me later. Now go on and smash the like button for me, and if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to this channel. I'd appreciate it. Thanks again.